Good afternoon. I hope you've seen that we have uh, our talk this afternoon available to you in both English and in Spanish. If you look at the little icon with the picture of the globe at the bottom of your screen, you can choose the language that you wish to listen to this talk in today. I wanna thank you all for coming to our program, Hostile Terrain 94, Reflections on Immigration and Public Facing Anthropology. I'm Mary Miller, Director of the GRI, the Getty Research Institute. And this talk is part of our Beyond Borders, Beyond Boundaries series of this year. Uh, <clears throat> we know that many of you are in distant locations and you may be on other continents even, as we'll see in just a minute, um, and far from Southern California, where I stand in my kitchen, my fake background notwithstanding, um, on traditional Tongva and Gabrieleño territory. Were we in person at Getty, we'd be welcoming you to our newly renovated lecture hall and named as of yesterday, the Ada Louise Huxtable Lecture Hall. I welcome you all virtually to the ALH. And you are coming today from Portugal, Italy, Australia, Peru, Venezuela, Spain, Brazil, and many other talks many other places. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers and our program. Jason de Leon, Professor of Anthropology and Professor of other disciplines and fields as well at UCLA, is here to discuss the origins of the Undocumented Migration Project. Jason's 2015 book, Land of Open Graves, won the Margaret Mead Award, and shortly thereafter, he was named a MacArthur Fellow. Jason will guide us today to examine some of his team's ongoing projects, and in particular, Hostile Terrain 94, a global participatory exhibition focused on migrant death. But his PhD work focused on the indigenous invention in Mexico some 3,000 years ago of the sharpest tools, some of the sharpest tools that humans have ever invented made from volcanic glass. And I keep thinking, Jason, that there must have been a conference where we saw each other across a room some 15 years ago when that was your field. We'll talk. But your intersections with the Getty are profound and as of today, ongoing. And that is where our program begins as our audience will soon discover. Our program today is in two parts, and part one begins with a conversation. To launch this conversation, I also introduce Miguel de Baca. Miguel is a senior program officer at the Getty Foundation. Before joining the Getty, Miguel was chair of the art and art history department at Lake Forest College. Educated at Stanford, and then earning his PhD at Harvard, Miguel de Baca was Terra Foundation Visiting Professor of American Art at the University of Oxford in 2017-18. He's active in the Mellon Mays Undergraduate Fellowship Program Network as a former Mellon Mays Fellow himself and serves as advisor to the Graduate Initiatives Program at the Social Science Research Council. Miguel's publications include a 2016 monograph on minimalist sculptor Anne Truitt and the edited volume, Conflict, Identity and Protest in American Art. At the Getty, among many other initiatives, Miguel is responsible for the Getty Foundation's Connecting Art Histories grants. I'm so happy to be introducing Miguel and Jason on screen today. And once again, I want to encourage you to select um, at the bottom of your screen, using the um, icon of the globe, English or Spanish as your preferred language. Jason and Miguel will chat for a bit, and then Jason will discuss hostile terrain. You should start posting questions in the Q&A as we go along. At the very end of this talk, Miguel will gather them up and pose them to Jason. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you so much, Mary, for that generous introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, with you, Jason. And um, I think the the order is very clear, and it it all will, uh, I think, go very beautifully together. From um, from what I understand, the career trajectory 
uh, to where you are now and the work that you're um, and the work that you're pursuing. I, I wanted to start, in a sense, um, at the at the very beginning before we get to hostile terrain itself. Um, and I, I'd love for you to set the stage a little bit uh, to tell us, you know, a little bit about your background, where you grew up. Um, and the very roots of what led you to study anthropology. Sure, sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Miguel and Mary and, and everyone at the Getty for having me. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here. I hope that everyone is is doing well and is, um, is, is, is safe and can see the end of this year long struggle that we've been going through. Um, I've been feeling pretty optimistic lately, so I hope that that, that, that is shared among some of our um, some of our participants here today. Um, you know, as Mary kind of hinted at, um, you know, I am a I'm an anthropologist who has, I think, gone through a whole bunch of different iterations. Um, you know, I grew up. I'm an army brat, so I grew up sort of all over the place, um, both in the U.S. and in um, and in Europe. <sighs> From an early age, I was very, very uh, interested in archaeology. I, mean, I came out of the generation of, of Indiana Jones. Um, I had spent a lot of time as a kid in Mexico visiting places like the pyramids of Teotihuacan, where I had just been really inspired early on by history, by the, the sort of monumentality of um, of Mesoamerican architecture. And so I really, you know, for the long since I was a kid, always wanted to be an archaeologist, but really not knowing kind of what that was going to look like. Um, I got to UCLA as an, as an undergraduate in 1995. I was a declared anthropology major because I knew I wanted to study archaeology. And then I lasted about five weeks. I took my midterm exams, failed failed them, um, moved out of the dorms, moved into my mom's garage, and then went back to playing music in this punk band that I had been in for, for quite a while. Um, I, I did that for a long time, um, failing at music and, um, and um, trying to figure out what it is I wanted to do with my life. Um, sort of by by default i ended up going back to ucla because i sort of became homeless at one point my when my mom moved out of state so i went back to ucla went back to trying to be, become an archaeologist and um and was still really struggling with that you know I, I felt like the things that i was excited about in archaeology weren't necessarily the things that i was being taught um and this is you know the, the kind of mid to late 90s where i think we have yet you know, we're working towards this this more inclusive understanding of you know of issues of diversity within the discipline of um, you know who gets to tell um, the story about the past. And so I think I, I sort of caught the discipline at a time where I was feeling very much excluded from um, from it. And um, but I sort of kept working my way through it. And what ended up really happening was through a series of semi random events. Um, I needed a job. So I got a work study job on campus and that work study job happened to be in an archaeology lab um, uh, at UCLA in um, um, Professor Jean Arnold's lab. And, you know, she hired me. I don't know why she I, I, I probably showed up to her office with a green mohawk um, with not a very good looking resume. And for whatever reason, she I felt pity on me or saw something in me and hired me. I worked in that lab for a couple of years and just got really excited about the discipline of archaeology, but I still wasn't quite sure, you know, if it was a thing I could I could potentially do or not. Um, and, you know, the right before my senior year in, in college, um, you know, someone had given me a flyer about an, an internship program at the Getty. And so, um, you know, I applied for this internship, what ended up being um, given this internship at the Fowler Museum um, on campus and ended up spending the summer, you know, working on an archaeological collection through the through the sponsorship of the Getty and that ended up being this kind of fundamentally life changing sort of event. Um, um, I, I really want to dig into that, but I actually if we could back up two seconds, you when, when we were sort of chatting this past week. Um, I, one of the things I was really struck by in your story is that you came into UCLA as an anthropology major, which I thought uh, was really advanced. Um, and you you were talking a little bit about being from the Indiana Jones generation, which um, you know, I, I was right there with you. I mean, I'm glued to that stuff. Um, but you mentioned this experience. I mean, first of all, 
to have had those interests in high school, I think is really remarkable. Um, and then you told me a little vignette, which I'm hoping you'll share with everyone else about this kind of uh, teacher that you had in yeah. high school that really kind of made an uh, imprint on your on what you wanted to study in college. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that happened to me in high school was, you know, I, I wanted to go to college. Um, I was, you know, I'm a first generation college student, um, but I really only wanted to study things that I was interested in. And so my, you know, my, my transcripts, much like, you know, my transcripts, my undergraduate transcripts, where, you know, I have an F in uh, a class called the Colonial Indians of Mexico from UCLA, um, which I had to explain away later on when I was applying to graduate school to study the indigenous people of, of Mexico. Um, but, you know, one of the things that happened in, in high school was um, I had this art history teacher, a guy named, named Rick Vandruff, who... I think recognized, you know, it was a, it was an AP art history class, and so we sort of did the 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 full well, as much as we could do a year long study of the history of art, um, and he understood that that I had a deep interest in history and in archaeology, and so he started adjusting um, some of the curriculum to focus more on archaeological issues. He started giving me things to read, um, and he was really the first person who kind of looked at me and said, look, you're interested in these things. This could be your career. You could become an archaeologist. And up to that point, you know, I had sort of maybe thought that was a possibility, um, but had never really considered it as, as, a, as a very serious one. I mean, I thought I was going to be a veterinarian or I thought I was going to teach high school history. Um, but, you know, he was really, really en encouraging and spent the whole year just kind of pushing me to think about archaeology because he sort of knew, too, that I was a screw up and that it was going to take a lot of uh, of help for me to sort of end up in a in a good place, and so I'm, you know, he really really fostered that that interest. And one of the things that I found so moving was at the end of the year, you know, he made little little awards for everybody in the class, you know, most improved student, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. And he made me this award that he called like the greatest, you know, uh, person with the most interest in history or archaeology, some, some, something along those lines. <laughs> Um, but what he had done is, you know, he was he, he had been a he was a sculptor. And so he had produced this um, Egyptian vase, painted it with inscriptions and then broke it and then fired it. So it looks like this sort of relic. And, you know, that sits on my on my on my desk at home. And it, if it hadn't been for him and that kind of mentorship, I don't know, um, you know, what where I would where I would be to today. I mean, he really was it was a fundamental person in my my development. And, you know, to the point he's one of the first people I thank in my in my in my dissertation. That's amazing. Yeah, I just I, I'm so struck that that that, that that person that first of all, that there was that art history course. I mean, my high school certainly did not have art history. So you were you were very um, fortunate to have had that. And I think it's just an extraordinary vignette. Um, OK, so you would you started at UCLA in 1995 ish and you dropped out, came back, declared your anthropology major, you know, kind of hated classes, sort of wandering around. And then, as you say, um, the, the Getty um, intern internship opportunity um, showed up. And so for those who are joining us who may not know about this internship program about, about which you're speaking, I'm just going to mention right now that the Getty Foundation, which is um, where I work, um, one of its flagship programs is the Getty Marrow Undergraduate Internships. And um, this is a, a program that began in... Um, 1993, in many ways, in, in response to the, the, the Watts uh, rebellion, and um, has grown now to, um, well, at first, I should say, it, it's a program which is meant to encourage greater diversity in the, um, in the museum and in the, the visual arts fields. And um, the, the, the main goal or objective is to support uh, full-time summer work uh, opportunities for uh, those with underrepresented backgrounds. Um, and now that program has grown over time to encompass 161 local arts institutions, um, including the Getty. And um, the external part is overseen by my colleague, Selena Preciado, who I hope is in the audience today. Um, and the internal part of the program is overseen by my colleague, Julie Butash. So, um, anyway, it is still a program which is alive and well. And you joined that program via the Fowler uh, in 1999 or 2000. I don't think we ever nailed down the chronology, but in any case, that was um, that, those were the early years. And so I, I guess as someone who 
uh, knows this program in a more evolved state, what was what was the internship like in a kind of general way? You know, my experience with the Fowler, um, you know, through this internship was really, it was one of the first times where I was given a lot of responsibility. Um, and I think that's what I really needed. Um, you know, up to that point, I felt like, like I had maybe people had been sort of sort of more talking at me or not really providing the opportunity for, for me to get for me to get, you know, my literally my, my hands dirty. And with the Fowler, um, you know, they basically said, look, we have this collection of artifacts from West Mexico that's 50 or 60 years old, hasn't been looked at in probably 35, 40 years. And we want you to just basically do a full inventory and assessment of what we have. And it really was this amazing kind of adventure for me where I spent the entire summer, you know, digging through boxes, looking at looking at these amazing artifacts and just getting com completely inspired. And I think one of the things I really I, I took from that experience was the power that comes when you give students you know, a significant amount of responsibility and they take ownership of a project. Um, you know, I really have taken that and tried to apply that to all of the work that we do with the undocumented migration project that I that I direct. And, you know, with students in the field, students in the lab, you know, in a lot of ways, I've used that model where I say, look, I've got a project that we want to get done and I can't do it and I trust you to do it. And so I want to facilitate that in as many ways as I possibly can. And, and that was really one of the things that, I, that I, I took away from that experience was that even me, this sort of lowly undergraduate, if given enough opportunity and support, could do this thing that, um, you know, was, was quite a colossal task. Mm -hmm. So, it, and for you, it was really the opportunity for a kind of participation, I guess you would say, a sort of um, coming alongside the work, which was really the the meaningful part uh, and 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 would you would you wager that it was that experience which then buoyed you into the next step you know taking your phd in in anthropology oh for sure i mean i i had gone into that internship interested in archaeology but i didn't know what was going to go what, what was going to happen beyond the the undergraduate degree and it was after that internship where i was like okay if i want to keep doing this you know one of the best ways to keep doing this is to, is to pursue a, a PhD. And so, you know, I was able to work with my mentors who were supervising me over the summer. I was meeting all these graduate students um, and faculty members who were working on these projects that were related and started to ask these questions about, okay, I've done all this stuff now. I'm starting to, to generate, um, you know, this this CV of experience. How do I then make, make the next kind of jump? And I think, for, you know, and that and the, the internship really focus my attention on Mexico, which which leading up to that had really been, I was thinking a lot more about California and, mm -hmm. you know, fall in, in the aftermath of that, I was, you know, I'm a full, I'm, I've been a, a Mexicanist ever, ever since. And so you, to, you pursue your PhD and um, I'm, I'm going to now kind of try to orient us toward the, the next part, which is really where I, I stop talking and you kind of take over here, but um, you, the, you characterized your um, archaeology training as really old school in some ways, and then there was a process of reinvention which happened um, in the in the around 2007 2008. Could you just narrate that transition a little bit for us, which will kind of I think help us set up for the the hostile terrain? Yeah, I mean, what what had happened was at the end of my like. In the midst of my dissertation work, which really focused on about 10,000 stone tools from a, a, a site in Mexico that's 3,000 years old that Mary was referring to, um, I was becoming increasingly more interested in the people that I was working with, women and men in Mexico who were helping to, you know, on these excavations, people who, who as I'm digging ditches with them, are, are talking about their immigration experiences that were profoundly, you know, moving and troubling. Um, I was becoming more interested in, in those people and those stories and less interested in the things that were actually coming out of the ground. And so, you know, I finished my PhD in ancient stone tools and then did what I would recommend no one do is, you know, go on the job market and say, I know I've just spent almost 10 years studying rocks and now I'm going to try to convince you that I'm, I'm a full-fledged ethnographer who's now going to work on this topic that, that I have no previous work experience with. Um, so I, but I did make that shift. It took me a little while to do it, um, you know, but I really reinvented myself as an ethnographer of, of migration you know, right after my after my PhD. And one of the big things that happened for me, and I think this is maybe one of the reasons I really love anthropology, 
is I've always thought about it as a discipline that is all encompassing and that whether it doesn't matter if you're doing archaeology or if you're a linguist or if you're an ethnographer or someone who studies DNA, it can all fall under the rubric of, of, of anthropology because we're interested in the human experience. And so for me, jumping around from topic to topic felt natural, you know, because I had this kind of anthropological, you know, curiosity. Um, but, you know, I end up in Mex I end up in Arizona um, 10 years after I had started this Getty internship. And now I'm starting to use archaeology to help understand the experiences of of Mexican migrants in the Arizona desert, you know, both through picking up the things that they've left behind, as well as through, you know, my long term ethnographic engagement with folks. Yeah, wonderful. So it's about it is a it is in many ways, both an object centered study, which which you carried from your previous training, but with the cultural and social uh, dimensions added to it, which, uh, of course, in, in the present context is um, is so important and so vital to, to recognize. Um, I think that that brings our section uh, to a close somewhat. So um, I'm going to hand over to um, the next part. Um, and then um, for, for those of you who had questions and answers, I know that there's an opportunity to ask them using the Q&A function. And then I'll I'll kind of keep them, keep an eye on those and aggregate them, and we'll come back together a little bit later and 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 talk some more. Great, thank you. Thanks. Okay, so now we're gonna um, we're gonna look at a, just a few slides, and I'm gonna introduce um, one of the current projects that I am uh, directing through uh, the Undocumented Migration Project. I just want to make sure that I can see. Um, so I, I'm not sure if the um, if the PowerPoint is up, I can't see it on my screen. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so bef before we play this video, you know, I just want to introduce quickly, since 2019, uh, one of the projects that the Undocumented Migration Project, which is this long-term research arts education collective that I direct, um, one of our current uh, works is uh, an exhibition called Hostile Terrain 94 that seeks to document and raise awareness about the uh, the countless deaths of migrants in the Arizona desert that have resulted from um, US federal border policies, in particular one policy called prevention through deterrence. Um, so in, in 2019, I became very interested in, in finding ways to create uh, exhibition work that could be accessible to um, a wide range of, of audiences and, and, and also find ways to collaborate with folks who are interested in raising awareness about these issues. And so I'm gonna just show a, a, a video real quick. This is a, from the Associated Press um, about a, a prototype that we did when I was teaching at the University of Michigan. So I'll, I'll, we'll play this video to introduce and then I'll talk through um, a couple of these slides. The exhibition is called Hostile Terrain 94 and it is a global participatory political art project whose goal is to raise awareness about America's humanitarian crisis at its southern border. We are um, basically conscripting people around the globe to spend an hour, half an hour, filling out toe tags for um, the dead, people who've been, whose bodies have been recovered in southern Arizona since about 2000. Um, and people are filling out these toe tags and then mounting them on a giant, on a giant wall map of Arizona. We'll do it in 93 locations, and then after that, in mid-October, we will ask everyone to send back all of their toe tags. So over 300,000 toe tags will be mailed back to us, and our 94th installation will happen, we hope, within a, a few blocks of the White House in November of, of 2020. So It makes me really sad because actually my grandparents and my uncles came here illegally, so like knowing that at some point they could have been the ones that I could have been writing this about. I think it's really important because this is something that a lot of people do not like to talk about politically and honestly socially. You'll follow the header on the sheet. The immigration is such a hot topic um, in today's climate um, and we're talking about um, all these people who are coming over, like all these kids, um, child separation is huge right now, building a wall. Um, but no one's talking about the thousands of people that are dying um, on the border due to U.S. policy. Okay, so um, that video obviously is old and, and pre-pandemic, and um, many of our of our plans have have had to um, adjust accordingly. Um, as a couple of updates, I will say that the idea had been to 
uh, install 94 exhibitions simultaneously and 94 representing the year 1994 um, when this the federal border policy known as prevention through deterrence goes into um, into effect and essentially it's a policy that attempts to funnel migrants towards places like the Sonora Desert of Arizona, which is what this map represents um, as a way to um, to slow them down. People are forced to walk across a very rugged, um, inhospitable terrain where they experience dehydration, um, uh, exhaustion, exposure to extreme um, uh, extreme environmental conditions. And this policy has led to the deaths of, of thousands of people. Um, so the idea had been to do 94 exhibitions. We are now up to about 150 exhibitions, which will run through probably the end of 2022. And these are participatory exhibitions that are happening on, on six continents. Um, you can go to our website, hostileterrain94.org, or you can go to the undocumentedmigrationproject.org to learn more about um, the locations where these, these shows are gonna be happening, um, including um, Southern California. But I know that we've got guests in, um, from, from Europe and, and elsewhere. We've got shows um, on, on, like I said, on, on six continents that will be coming um, very soon. But one of the ideas for the show was, this is a map of migrant death in Arizona. And I have been trying to find ways to, um, to take this spatial data and convert it into something that is more, um, um, hum that's more that, that humanizes these deaths in, um, in, in, a, in a kind of more co compelling way. And so we, we've converted this, this um, Google map into um, you know, a 3D uh, living and breathing uh, uh, exhibition. If we can go to the next slide, please. So this is what hostile terrain looks like once it's completed, and it's about 3,400 toe tags. The orange tags represent people who are unidentified, so it's about a thousand unidentified bodies, and the Manila represents um, those bodies that have that have names attached to them. And like I said, it's about um, 20, 2,200, 2,300 um, named bodies. Although the research we've been doing for for over a decade now suggests that this is just a drop in the bucket, and many people die um, in these remote locations, and we have we have not nor will we ever recover their bodies um, for various reasons. Uh, next slide, please. So hostile terrain is an attempt to take, you know, a, a point on a spreadsheet, uh, a point on a Google map and ask our partners to um, to help construct a, a 3D version of this. And so here you, you've got an image of someone um, attaching one of these filled out toe tags in the exact location of where that particular body was found. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and it's a it's a complicated endeavor. Um, it requires a lot of logistical planning. Um, although the way that we're doing it is our hosting partners receive these kits. Um, the exhibition is, is relatively cheap to install. Um, it's between fifteen hundred and two thousand dollars. We are fundraising to. Um, to subsidize the cost of these exhibitions in um, in developing countries and places that that can't afford to to host these shows, uh, but at the end of the day, all of our hosting partners get you know boxes of toe tags, um, uh, instructions on how to fill out the the tags, and then all the directions and other materials needed uh, to mount the um, the piece. Next slide, please. And. Um, you know, one of the things that comes with with mounting this exhibition is you get to just see the the massive amount of death that has occurred uh, on U.S. soil, and it's it's really something different to see it represented as a as a one dimensional um, you know digital map versus seeing you know a wall of toe tags that are just overlapping so much that you can't even see uh, the map uh, behind it. Next slide, please. Uh, the 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 physical exhibitions also have um, QR codes uh, associated with them, so you can scan the wall with your cell phone and you can hear the stories of migrants from the desert, the stories of those who have lost loved ones. And it also has a, a virtual uh, augmented reality component that's cell phone accessible, where you can tour the desert, um, talk to, um, um, to avatars who are either migrants themselves or who are people who work um, with these uh, humanitarian uh, causes. Uh, so it's a fully it has a, 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 a fully digital component that tries to amplify the voices of of, of migrants themselves. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that we're that we that I'm most interested in really is is not just having you as an audience member come to a location and look at a wall map of migrant death, um, but what we really want to do is we want you to come and experience the the exhibition by um, 
by coming into the gallery or where, 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 or church or community center, having a seat, and then we hand you um, these blank these blank toe tags, and we ask you to to help us build this wall, um, and not not a a border wall, but a wall that represents the the, the humanity that has um, that has been lost along the U.S. Mexico border for the last the last several decades. Next slide, please. And so we ask you, audience members, to come to fill out um, information for the dead. We invite you to write messages on the back of these tags. Um, this tag on the left for Carmita Maricela Zaguipuya. She was a 31-year-old uh, mother of three from Ecuador, whose body my team unfortunately um, encountered in 20, um, 2012. And you know, for a lot of these exhibitions, she is the one toe tag that that I personally fill out um, and and write messages on the back. But but people from around the globe have been doing this and writing um, all kinds of messages in in many different languages about how they are affected by this process. Uh, next slide, please. And um, you know, these get mounted, um, and we invite people to you know to really in, engage with this wall. Um, Oftentimes you're able to touch the tags to, to be able to rotate them to, to try to read read all the various names, uh, but we really want it to be this this collaborative um, and um, engaged uh, experience. Next slide, please. And it, it's a lot of labor. I mean, we've got a, a full a full team right now that we are trying to um, to support to keep these shows going, and we've got hundreds of you know thousands of volunteers now around the globe who have been helping to um, to install these shows. And so we've we've done about twenty five so far, and like I said, we've got about another hundred and, and twenty five that are that are on the way. Next slide, please. Oh, and here's a, a time lapse of what it looks like when they when they build it. And so I, I would invite you all to to come check out these exhibitions if you can. Um, we've got multiple Southern California shows coming up um, in this year and into next year. And really, the the most important part of it for us is for you just to be able to come and, and spend a few minutes, you know, filling out toe tags, writing out the names of the dead, and and we look to our to our audience, to our collaborators, to our participants as people who can help you know, breathe life into, um, into these tags to help us memorialize those who have lost their lives and remember. Um, and we would hope also to raise enough awareness that we can, as, as a collective, fight for, um, you know, for, for positive social change. And you know, during the pandemic, we have had to, to, to shift um, everything around and do a whole bunch of different, um, different things to, um, to, to make adjustments, as, as we all have. And one of the ways that we've tried to um, to maintain engagement with our with our participants and our collaborators is through what we're calling a, a moment of global remembrance. This is a digital project where we are trying to collect um, audio or video recordings from people around the world, reading out the names of the dead. Um, and so, if if folks are interested in participating right now with us you know but before we're able to to get back together in, in person um, we would love for you to to get involved and 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 sub submit your video to to this project we're going to play a, a short clip here for you to, to see how it works um, and if you're interested in participating just go to our website and you know you send us an email a very short just an email with your name and location and we will send you all of the instructions on on how to participate but here we'll give you a you know a 30 second um, preview of of what this moment of global remembrance uh, currently looks like. Please play the video. Name, unidentified. Age, unknown. Reporting date, September fifth, twenty ten. Cause of death. Undetermined. Alfonso Salas Villagrán, edad 64 años, fecha del informe 22 de agosto de 2006, causa de la muerte, cardiopatía. Name, David Orocho Homo, alto 20, meldedatum 28 de septiembre 2004, todesursache, 
Verletzung durch stumpfe Gewalt. So what we're going to do now, uh, before we get into um, into the Q and A, is I we, we would just like to take a, a a moment of silence to remember the the thousands of people who have died crossing the U.S. Mexico border, the thousands of people who who have died and continue to die crossing many borders around around the globe. Um, and so I'm going to just uh, mute my camera for for this moment of of silence, and then we will. Um, resume our, our conversation. Huh. It's always hard to, to, to transition into something um, to something else after talking about um, this ongoing tra tragedy uh, along the U.S. Mexico border. Um, and but we want we want to find ways for you, uh, audience members, to um, to to engage with with us and to to help foster uh, a, a dialogue. And so what we'd like to do for maybe the next minute or two is if you have any um, any thoughts, um, you know, a, a feeling about the, the things that we've just talked about in regards to, to migrant death, we've, we're going to open up the chat, uh, the chat function, and we ask you as, as audience members to just submit, you know, one or two words uh, about how perhaps you're feeling about this, this topic or um, you know uh, the idea of a memorial, or or just the just just how you're you're sort of digesting the the things that we've that we've just um, been been discussing. And so the, the chat function is open, and we'll just give you a, a minute or so if you want to put in a, a few words before we uh, move into the, the the question and answer um, section. So th thank you all for. For your for your comments right now and for your um, your your statements, I'm not sure if everybody can read the chat. I think they, I think you can, um, but you know you're, you're, we're seeing things like um, connected, sad, um, uninformed, frustrated, fearful. Um, you know, I think this this topic brings up all of these emotions, and um, I hope at the, at the end of the day, it it fosters new uh, and productive. Uh, dialogues about this topic that we have um, periodically ignored off and on. I mean, uh, we're going to get into this more, I think, in the Q&A, and we, I would encourage you to start submitting questions um, through the Q&A. Uh, but it does feel like to me that we're in a moment where we, we are asking new things of this current administration. We're asking um, um, to to repair a lot of damage that has been done in the last four years. But also, I think we need to be thinking about the damage that has been done over the last 30 years. And um, it's only by being informed and by being engaged, I think, can we have better conversations around this issue and, um, you know, more nuanced and, and more, um, I would hope, um, inspiring and um, action motivated co conversations as well. So, so thank you everyone for, for, for submitting um, those, those, those comments in the chat. We now have about, um, about 15 minutes in 
the um, left in the program for a Q&A. And so I think Miguel is going to come back on. The, the Q&A is open if people want to um, to begin submitting questions uh, and or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to um, to start uh, just kind of going down the going down the line here, though, I think someone um, from from our team is going to is going to help me, me, me collate. Um, OK, so, and in fact, I think that I my video is about to go on. Um, just as soon as. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for that, Jason, and for that um, really powerful exercise. Sometimes just trying to distill one's thoughts into a single word is extremely difficult, but um, reading the reading the words in aggregate is really like a poem um, and is just um, so moving and, and, and um, there's no other word, so moving. Um, the, there are many different questions. I think um, some of the questions I think have to do with forging an interface between the anthropological ethnographic work and the artwork. Um, but I think some of the, the questions are simply um, in many ways about the emotional affect of the piece itself and, um, and its resonance with the viewers. Uh, someone asked, has any of the exhibitions helped loved ones of the dead identify a, uh, a family member? You know, that's a great question. We'd, the exhibition itself um, is designed to connect audiences with nonprofits that are working on these issues. And so one of our big partners is the, the Colibri Center for Human Rights, which is a Tucson based organization that seeks to reunite uh, families of the missing and of the dead um, with their loved ones. And so we um, in, in all of our programming, you know, we, we, we work hard to highlight that work. And so people come to these shows, they have questions um, uh, about how to, you know, help a loved one who has lost someone in the desert or, or how can they learn more about the, about how people actually reconnect with their loved ones, then we were able to um, um, to do it through those through those mechanisms. A big part of of the work too is these shows happen in all these different locations and we we think about it as we're giving our collaborators the basic show, the basic exhibition piece, you know, whatever you want to call it, and then we encourage them to design other um, programming around that. So you know, there, every community has, has, has immigrants in their community um, who, who have their own unique issues that they are dealing with. And so we ask our partners to say, okay, how can you take the show and, you know, um, what's happening in Omaha, Nebraska? How can we connect with, with immigrant communities there? And so folks will bring in speakers, local speakers and activists who are working on, on those issues there. Or, you know, our partners in Europe, how can they connect what's happening in Arizona to what's happening in a place like, um, you know, the Mediterranean? And so it's this collaborative dialogue that we are trying to create amongst a, a range of different partners. And, and part of that, too, is to connect folks to nonprofits that they can donate time and money towards that they can volunteer with, um, but fi finding ways for people to get to get involved, um, either directly or or indirectly. That's, that's great. There is a, a actually a question from someone that just came in that, that said, um, aside from the uh, aside from the hostile terrain 94 project, how can memory workers, especially archivists get involved with work for the um, undocumented migrant project or the Calibri Center? You know, you can just visit our website, um, undocumentedmigrationproject.org, and you can just send us an email, um, you know, with a, with a question or, um, you know, if you're looking to, to connect with someone, if, if we can't help, we um, can definitely connect you to, um, to other organizations that are working on working on similar issues. And, um, you know, we there's still the potential for people to host this show as well. Um, we've, we've sort of slowed down. I mean, 150 exhibitions is a lot of work. Um, and so we've, we've really kind of dialed back on this now, but um, but there is the potential uh, if if it works out to, to add, a, a, you know, new shows that people are, are interested in, in hosting. But I would just encourage folks to go to our, um, our website or check out our social media and, and send us a, a message. Yeah. Um, I want to go back, uh, I think, to some of the, um, emotion, which uh, that the the installation provokes. There's a lot of questions in the Q and A about that. Um, Luisa Martinez asks, "I imagine this is very impactful for the people filling out the tags. 
what have been some reactions, hopefully transformations after this process? And as a corollary question, I think a very good one, uh, for the non-participant, how has the piece been digested? It seems that filling out the tags is the main element uh, and just wondering what the effects are on people who are just viewing it. You know, every show is different, um, you know, and I think that, you know, based on the many prototypes that we've done, um, all of the feedback sessions that we've done with participants, um, you know, I think people get um, they get a lot out of the experience. I mean, I think it's a very difficult, um, troubling experience for for folks, but but I do think that they come out of it with a, a different kind of sense of of what it means to migrate, how people you know um, um, suffer um, needlessly on a, on a daily basis, uh, and you know so we've gotten the, the the feed that's been the feedback from people who who oftentimes have no connection to this issue at all. The folks who do have connection to this issue, I think, come at it from a very different way, um, and 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 take something else from it. You know, folks who have crossed themselves or whose family members have crossed the border, you know, for them filling out a toe tag is, is a much different experience than someone who is just learning about this for the first time. And um, I think the benefits for, for both have been really um, uh, incredible for, for us to see. You know, we spend a lot of time on site facilitating conversations with um, with participants, having people talk about their feelings. Um, we take a, a significant amount of constant feedback about how we can better engage with with different kinds of audiences. And um, but I but I do think that, um, you know, the 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 overwhelming response to this show, even though it's difficult to, I think, participate, has been that people have found, um, you know, deep, deep value in it uh, in terms of those who, who aren't able to fill out toe tags. Um, I think people, there's an enough um, in these installations where people can um, just being around this, the, the, the piece, I think can be a very powerful experience um, just, just to touch it and just to, to, to know that it represents so many lost lives. Um, you know, but we, we also try to provide a lot of context so people don't come into it and we're not re-traumatizing people who, you know, who are already, who, who are already traumatized by the migration experience. Right. So, you know, we, we spend a lot of time sort of with the lead up and then as well as a kind of debriefing with folks, um, whether it's with our participants or, you know, providing contextual material for those folks who are just coming in as, as visitors. Yeah, and, and that dovetail, that goes right into another question, which I think is very interesting from Audrey Harris, who asks, uh, there have recently been controversies regarding sensitivity or compensation for interview subjects around issues related to trauma. Uh, and how, how do you address these issues in your interviews with human subjects around traumatic stories? Well, that's a different part of the work. You know, so I mean, this this exhibition, um, the interviews that we that we include, it's it's really only a handful of interviews mm -hmm. that are included in the in the in the augmented reality, um, or the um, the digital um, um, stuff. I mean, I interview hundreds of people, probably thousands of people now, um, be, because of the ethnographic research that I'm, that I'm currently doing. But you know, but, but this show really is um, is focused on publicly accessible data. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a kind of minimal, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you do engage with some folks, but most of the interviews that, that are um, represented are either with folks that I've been interviewing for a decade now, um, you know, folks that I've written extensively about in my, in my first book, um, or they come from, um, from people who, who are collaborating with the Colibri Center for Human Rights, who have, you know, who have willingly and enthusiastically um, wanted to tell their stories about, um, you know, what has happened to their, to their relatives. Um, you know, so I don't really face an issue here of, in, in terms of compensation. Um, that's, that's, but that is a, a, a question that I, address and, and discuss in, in great detail in other in other parts of my work. Yeah, um, but, you know, as, but as far as I'm concerned, I mean, people should be compensated for their time. Um, and we need to find ways to, you know, to think about how we can truly collaborate with folks who are, you know, who are sharing their, 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 their stories and really um, providing social scientists with, you know, with this information that we consider to be data, but which really is, you know, huge parts of, you know, of their of their personal lives. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, if I if I were to zoom out from that and, and go to 30,000 feet, I think there's a, a question in there in somewhat inspired by uh, my colleague Heather McDonald's question in the Q&A about um, the relationship between Hostile Terrain 94 and your academic ethnographic research. Um, the way that I would pose the question is when you look at an installation such as this, 
um, and, and Jason, you and I have talked about this at length, actually, uh, before this uh, before this Zoom session. But uh, where is it? Where does the ethnography? You know, where is it art, and where is it ethnography? Where is the anthropology? Where is it an installation? And part of what I'm thinking here is that I'm looking. I'm thinking about what contemporary, you know, in my field of contemporary art, you have relational aesthetics and you have participatory aesthetics, which are very current right now. You have uh, works from the 1970s, like uh, Suzanne Lacey's Three Weeks, uh, Three Weeks in May, which of course was about um, uh, was about rape and, and and using mapping. And so there there is a sort of art historical context here. So uh, for you, how do you envisage that interface between uh, ethnography, anthropology, and kind of capital A art. Yeah, you know that's an excellent question, and it's one that that I've sort of only had to think about in retrospect in a lot of ways, because I I feel like the way that my brain works is at the, at the end of the day, the goal is to engage with as many people as possible. It's to to translate social science data about the experiences that people have, you know, crossing borders. It's it, my goal is to translate that information so that I can create more, so I can help create more empathy so that I can help educate um, a, a public more um, and in, in a new um, and in, in different kinds of ways. And so to do that, you know, some days I'm an anthropologist, some days I'm an archaeologist, some days I'm a curator. Um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to evolve to to find kind of new directions to, to take the work in and i can't always keep up with actually like oh you know there's all this stuff happening here that i'm not that i that i'm not directly engaged with because i'm sort of i'm thinking about it as more you know i'm an and i'm an anthropologist who's pretending to be a an artist who's pretending to be a photographer who's pretending <laughs> to be a curator um you know and and you can call it whatever you want i think as long as you engage with it and i think and i and i would hope take something meaningful from it but um but now that I've been, you know, that, that these projects, especially the, the last two big exhibition projects have happened, you know, as I've been starting to write the stuff up and think about it in a historical context, you know, it's really forcing me to to have new and, and more interesting con kinds of conversations about these things. But I think at the end of the day, I wish it wasn't me making it up as I as I went. I think I wish that that I had had that more anthropologists were being trained to think interdisciplinarily. Um, and not just, you know, within the discipline of anthropology or, you know, let me think about other social sciences, but really engaging with the humanities and the arts. Um, that's the space that I really want to be in. And I think that's the space that my brain tries to push this work in. And then um, I get in there and then I have to figure out, okay, what's actually happening right. in this scene and, right. and how does this all fit together? Right. So, I mean, thinking about the art, thinking about art or the arts as creative problem solving in a sense, which is a, a very productive way of, of conceptualizing it. Um, I, I think uh, we're, we're running close on time. I'm, I'm, I realize that there are many uh, questions um, and uh, hopefully uh, there will be an opportunity for some of those questions to be answered uh, over, over email. But um, there is a, 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 a question that really sort of stood out to me um, in this, on all of these roles that you embody, uh, anthropologist, artist, curator, photographer, um, and also the the emotional demands that the work itself asks of you in, in all of those roles. How has this work, and this is a question asked by Maddie Wood, how has this work impacted your sense of self? And do you perceive your place in this tragedy or in the world differently than before you began this um, exhibition? And I might sort of add as a kind of coda to that, uh, is there a way that you disengage or become, how do you kind of nourish yourself while also um, necessarily having to be open to the emotional demands that the, the content makes on you? You know, it is, it has been life changing for me um, in terms of, you know, when I began this project over a decade ago, I, you know, I think I was very dismissive about my own feelings. I think I came to I came to everything as this, you know, I'm a social scientist. Um, I am objective. I am a, I am a hardened person, and you know, um, you know, I, I thought in a lot of ways my own kind of experiences, you know, growing up and the things I had been exposed to, that I had a certain sort of 
callous towards, you know, I, I could handle particular forms of, of, of suffering, um, you know, and as long as I was wearing my sort of scientist hat. And I've come to, you know, think the opposite, that over the years, I've become, if nothing, I've become way more sensitive to these issues on a, on a personal level, where, um, you know, I thought that the more I was exposed to other people's trauma, the I thought the easier it would get. And in, in fact, it's the, it's the complete opposite. I think that um, I'm more of an emotional wreck now than I was a decade ago, you know, because of this work. And, um, and I'm okay. And I'm, I'm okay with that. I think that that reminds me that both that, that I am human and that these are things that, that, that impact me and they should impact me. And, um, and I've just got to, you know, and I'm, I come from a very privileged position in that, you know, my, I study the experiences of other people, which are oftentimes, you know, traumatic. And so, um, I put myself into these scenarios and it, then it's it's not my job to complain about it. It's just my job to figure out how to keep doing the best possible work that I can within this context. Um, but, you know, I have had to, um, you know, to, to figure out my own boundaries and to figure out how to, you know, what, what you know, what good self-care is. And I think, you know, the question about how does one disengage, you know, I've periodically had to do that where, um, you know, I'm working on a, a book right now. I'm like knee deep in a book that I've been working on since 2015 and it largely revolves around death and murder. And I had to take a, about a year and a half off from the book writing and the book research to just regroup and to, you know, try to put myself in a, in a healthier position so that I could go back and, and write in a, I think a, a healthy and, and productive kind of way. And so I, I see like, it's not just self-care as a form of like, self perseverance i think it's it's my job to take care of myself in this whole thing so that i can go back to the work and do the best i can in trying to help people tell their tell their own stories um but you know that's a, an interesting conversation that i think social scientists and and a lot of other folks who are dealing with 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 the representation of representation of trauma we often no times get to have those conversations about you know what it means to be in that world for for so long and how to to come out of it you know as unscathed as as possible well, the, the emotional life of, uh, of academia and the emotional life of artists can be another ethnographic study uh, for another time, maybe. But yeah. um, um, thank you so very much, Jason. This was terrifically interesting. Um, and I am so, so happy that you were able to uh, devote some time to be uh, with us today and to um, talk about uh, your your journey and to talk about this this beautiful installation. Um, and I'll hand over now to uh, Mary to wrap things up, but thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, there have been questions in the chat. Will this be available? It will be available on the Getty YouTube channel in about two weeks. Um, look for it there, along with most of our programs that, we've, that have taken place um, online this year. And for those of you who pose particular questions in the chat, in the Q&A, we will hope to uh, get these to the right people. I think one question might even be directed to me um, and to answer these questions um, over the next few days. And most of all, I want to thank our guests, Jason De Leon, Miguel De Baca, who have provided us such uh, an insightful and dare I say, very, very intense afternoon here in Southern California. So thank you all. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again at a program soon at the Getty Research Institute.